And as I'm starting to sit up, the doctor says, look, there's a 0% chance this baby will make it. And we have to save you, Aaron. And she just looks at him squarely in the eye and says, well, doctor, we believe in miracles and we want you to believe with us. She had a level of faith in that moment that the Lord could operate in. Roughly halfway through the pregnancy of their second child, Blake and Aaron Hamby were told by doctors that due to a severe internal complications, there was a 0% chance that their baby would live. What the doctors didn't know was that God had spoken to Aaron and he had told her something different. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that places you in the heart of the experiences that changed people's faith and understanding of God. I'm Stacey McCants, and we continue to pray that God speaks to you through what you hear in our episodes. Many of you have reached out to us to let us know that He's doing just that for you. We are deeply grateful to hear about God faithfully answering those prayers. If you'd like to reach out to us with guest ideas, prayer needs, or to let us know how God is moving in your life, you can do that at astrongerfaith.org slash contact. Today's conversation is about faith, especially when faced with the impossible. Please meet Blake Hamby. <laughs> Good. Had a friend. I had an actual uh, former guest. I get a text message from him one day, and he's holding this book. He says, I just read this book. You got to read this book. This is from a friend of mine. I wrote it. His name is Blake. I said, okay, sounds good. And so I read the book, gave you a call, sent me your number. And um, the book, it's a, it chronicles the story of you and your family, especially you and your wife, with your second child, who was born extremely premature. Not just a couple of weeks, but like a lot of weeks. And so following that book is is a is a little bit of an emotional roller coaster because you're yeah, absolutely yeah we're in the boat with you there and, and you do a great job y'all do a great job of of bringing that out and you talk about faith and and you talk about prayer um but it's not as much about that as it is sort of chronicling your journey through that time and all the things that you experienced but in there is peppered your faith and and so i, I was like man we got to I want to I want to explore that side a little bit more of it. So, um, so yeah. So Blake, welcome. You're here, man. Yeah, it's exciting to be here. It's you a- and your wife, Aaron. I know y'all have told this story in some Sunday school classes and a few other places. And um, and I think the best thing to do is to start with how Aaron. Aaron is your wife. How you guys? How your daughter? came to be brought into the world so early. Yeah, absolutely, Stacy. And yeah, before I jump into that, thank you for letting me be here and just kind of share a little bit, and I'm excited. Good. Um, but like you said, just from a uh, kind of the short version, and you and I were chatting before, and, you know, it's a long story, and we won't get into all the details, but I think for context purposes to kind of give you and the listeners just an idea of who we are and, like you said, how did faith get into this world? So, September of 2011, um, my wife, who grew up in South Louisiana, proud Cajun, uh, realized she wanted to be baptized. Uh, she'd actually been baptized in, in college, actually at the University of Alabama, uh, but really just felt that on her heart for whatever reason. And so we had a big baptismal at our, our church on a Wednesday night. And during that time, Faith, I'm sorry, um, Aaron was pregnant with our second child, very early in the pregnancy. And so as she's getting baptized, one of the things she tells me later is, I asked the Lord, don't let this just be something I do. Let it change my life forever. And um, The baptism. The baptism, yes. And didn't think much about that when she told me that as we saw the events over the next going forward weeks and months. Maybe I would have cautioned her not to say that. (laughs) I have that that bold, bold of a prayer. But anyway, that evening uh, we wake up, I wake up probably one in the morning in, in our bedroom and I can hear kind of this, this, this noise and I was like, what is that? And it's Aaron calling my name. It's like, Blake, come here. And I realize she's not in the bed. 
I go into the bathroom that's kind of right there by our bedroom. And the first thing I, I see, I realize this is not a good situation. Hmm. So she's there. There's some blood. And you can tell she's been crying a little bit. And she just simply says, Blake, I think we lost the baby. How, how far along was she there? At that point, Stacy, she was probably, I think, about 11 weeks. Oh, 10 wow. Or 11 okay, weeks. yeah. Uh, so very early in the pregnancy. And so we kind of digest that, honestly, a, a situation that I know so many parents go through uh, the first time we had had that experience, but just prayed, called the doctor's line, and just kind of tried to digest where we were at. And um, I remember that evening my wife saying, you know, she just seemed a little less phased than I might have thought she would have been. And she was like, you know, Blake, the the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but in either situation, I'll bless his name. And I just have to have to take confidence and faith in that. And I'm listening to her say that and like, how can you say that? I mean, this is, I, you know, just, I was amazed at her faith. So the next day, go to the doctor, I, um, leave work to go, go there with her. And I remember walking into the, the, the OBGYN's office and Aaron's kind of sitting over in the corner away from everyone it's raining outside, and and I can just see her staring out the window, and and I see some tears rolling down her face, and kind of go over and just give her a hug, and I'm like, how are you doing? She's like, I'm I'm good. I'm just I'm just sad. You know, that's really all all she had to say. And uh, so we go back into the 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 examining room, and they check her out, and honestly, everything checks out fine. Like the um, the, the sonogram tag does the scan and healthy heartbeat. So we start trying to, I mean, we're very thankful, but we try to digest that, try to understand like, yeah, man, Lord, thank you so much for allowing this baby to be here and for Aaron to be okay. And so we kind of think that, you know, that's kind of the end of the story, that we're just going to roll on to a normal pregnancy. Well, about two or three weeks later, we're down in Mobile uh, with my parents, my mom. We're doing a surprise retirement party for her. And my wife wakes up at three o'clock in the morning. And this time she's not just bleeding, but she's kind of shivering and has having these little bit convulsions going on. Um, and all she can say is, call your sister, call Amanda. And my sister's a nurse, her and her husband both. And they are there at the hotel at the battle house with us. Call them. Amanda comes in and very quickly assesses the situation, says, look, let's call the, call the ambulance. And I'm thinking, well, that seems pretty serious. And my sister's like, well, I think this is a little serious. We need to have this checked out. Uh, so the ambulance comes, and I remember as we're leaving the Battle House Hotel, they have my wife on a stretcher. By this point, it's probably 3.30 in the morning. And I remember as I'm walking into the back of the ambulance, just having this thought that God can meet us here, even if it's the very first time we ever even considered him. But I am so thankful that I do know him as I'm walking into this situation that would appear to be so dire with my wife and baby not knowing where this is going. All right, so you, you, they're loading her up in an ambulance at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're thinking about your faith? Exactly. I'm thinking about the small groups I've been in, the church hmm. services, other people that I've talked to over years— because I'm looking at my wife, and I distinctly remember this, Stacy stepping into the back of that ambulance, and she needed me to have what she had in our bathroom about three weeks before, where there was just a confidence in who the Lord is. And I just distinctly remember thinking, I know the Lord could show up here, even if it's the first time I've ever even acknowledged He may or may not exist. But I was so thankful that I'd had a, a basis of faith. Mm. Okay, that's so. So you didn't lose the baby the first time, and now it's. It sounds like what happened, I guess, a few weeks before was like multiplied a little bit. That's right. And so, did you feel like you lost the baby then, or we did? So the second time, we felt like for sure after the first time. Now the second time, we're going to lose the baby or we have lost the baby because there was again bleeding and it just did not, it looked even worse than the first time we go to the hospital. Everything checks out fine again. Yeah. So at this point in my mind, I'm like, all right, this is not normal. Don't tell me this is normal. 
Tell me why this is happening. Do they have any answers as to why these things were happening? This is twice. It's a great question, Stacy. And I remember thinking as we were at Mobile Infirmary that second time, like, could you just give me some answers, even if they're bad answers? Because this just doesn't seem normal. But no, they really just said sometimes pregnancies are worse than others. They mentioned that there could be something called a subcutaneous tear, some medical term that obviously I was not familiar with. But for the most part, Stacy, they really just said it, you know, sometimes these things just happen. And that probably for me was as concerning as if they would have said the world's collapsing and there's not much we can do, but we know why this is happening. Do they give you any, any indication as to, so my next question as a husband and a dad is how serious, I mean, is this life threatening to anyone? Yeah. Another great question. So Aaron at the time was a PE teacher. And so we asked those questions like, you know, Aaron is going every day and teaching uh, middle school students, physical education, and she's out playing volleyball and basketball and all these things with them. Does she not? Does she need to quit or not quit? But just does she need to take a break, uh, go on FMLA or something? And and the doctors at Mobile, as well as her her OBGYN, as we came back and she's talked to to her, um, they said no, just just maybe take it easy. Just take it a little bit easy, which, again, to me, did, didn't seem to compute. And let me be clear, we're not um, – we have full respect and faith in her doctor and in the advice we received. I, I do not think that was wrong. Yeah. It just was dis- – it was concerning because I was like, I, it seems like we should do something different. All right, so, so what's going on spiritually during this time? I mean, this is twice you feel like you've lost this child – what is faith looking like? What's prayer looking like during this time? You know, I said earlier as I was walking into the back of that ambulance that um, I was glad that I had a faith. I knew the Lord, and I'd been, I'd been in church. I'd been in Sunday school. I'd, you know, I, I had a, a prayer life, a faith life, but it was like this Sunday school lesson, these things that I've read about, heard from other people, is now my reality. And honestly, it... it um, I never really lost ultimate faith in the Lord, but I really just didn't understand why this is happening. Everything we were praying for, not just up until this point, but as this point progresses, it was going in the exact opposite direction. And I remember just this this part in me was just, Lord, I, I believe that you're here, but I just don't understand this. I don't, I don't why is this happening? Yeah. And then I would start to feel bad because I'm questioning, because it's really my wife who is physically at in, in such a, a, a bad place. And I'm starting to feel bad about myself because where is your faith? I can't, I mean, this isn't even your physical ailment, Blake, but why are you, why are you struggling with this so much? And so it was really an odd situation for me personally, where again, I never lost like ultimate faith that the Lord was who he says he was. But I just had all these questions, and the questions would turn into frustration and just, just I, I don't, it probably borderlined on anger and just like, why, why is this happening? What can we do? What can I actually do to help change what's happening to my wife and our unborn baby? Is that what you were praying? It wasn't what I was praying, no. Were you just praying for healing and that it would stop and you'd deliver the baby healthy and, or or... What were you praying? Do you remember? I do, and, and it, it's in line with what you were just saying, Stacey. I mean, I was praying the normal things. I think that a person, a dad, a, a believer would pray in that is, Lord, I, I ask that you would, you know, heal my wife, God. I know that I know that you are the great physician, and we believe you haven't closed up shop, and we pray that this bleeding would stop, that, that the baby would be okay, and all these things would, would come to pass. Um so those were the things I was praying, but the reality in front of me was the, the exact opposite of what I was praying. And then I would start to, again, feel bad because I would get maybe a little disheartened or frustrated. And then I would realize, well, Lord, you don't owe me anything. I mean, I, I believe you and I need to just keep walking in faith. But it was just this inner, a level of inner turmoil where, again, I, I, 
I wanted to believe, but then I felt, I don't know a way to say it other than just felt bad about myself for then being frustrated that it wasn't happening, so to speak, in the way that I wanted it to happen. So this is a beginning, beginnings of the conversation of faith. So Jesus says you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Move this mountain into the sea. It's like how much faith do you need to have <laughs> to pray for and receive a healthy pregnancy? That's a great question. Um, you know, as we went through this journey, Stacy, and you and I have talked maybe a little bit about this. Um, it's hard for me to think about the right answer to that because as we got deeper into this journey, jumping ahead in the story a little bit, we saw other people go through very similar situations, much harder situations, much more dire situations with much different outcomes on this earth. And, um, and I saw a level of faith in them in probably the worst situations that was well beyond what I was having in, in kind of these light and momentary troubles that I was experiencing. And, and I think that's one of the things that I really have struggled with. It was even a big part of when we were writing this book and trying to decide if we should do this because of the outcome we got with our story we did not want to hold that up that uh, we had, we prayed harder or had more faith because we, we didn't, you know, I, I don't know the, the reason the Lord gives certain answers in certain situations, but, uh, um, I do know that in the times when we, we didn't feel like anything good was coming of this and we saw it even more so in others that the Lord's presence was just there even in the smallest of faith or whatever you, you want to call it. But. All right. I, I got a lot of things that um, are swirling around in here, and I'm going to try my best to get them out properly. Scripture's pretty clear that small amounts of faith um, change things. Jesus is pretty clear in Scripture that we don't even have a small amount of faith. When the disciples, when Jesus said, hey, look, I'm going to send you out. This is while Jesus is still here. He sends out the 12 and then the 72. <clears throat> he tells them, I've given you authority um, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, uh, cleanse lepers, and all this stuff. I don't think, in my view, my opinion, I don't think they had really done that themselves mm -hmm. up until that point. They'd watched Jesus do it. And then he said, I give you authority, so go do it. And I, I, I don't know, I imagine they looked around at each other like, really? <laughs> I mean, what do we got to lose? He just said it. They go out, they do it, and they come back like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Demons are like subject to us in your name. And, I, and he's like, yeah, I told you. But it was an awakening, and suddenly they experienced it. And so it built their faith so that they went out and did these things. And, of course, after his ascension, he tells us that we can be, we're all going to be able to do these things that we believe in him. Now, when we get in hard situations, we can question God and why all the why questions yeah you know I, I, it's understandable i don't really grapple with why too much i'll be honest with you mm -hmm. and the reason i don't grapple with why too much is because god is infinite in his intelligence and there is no amount of intelligence i'm going to ever have that's going to comprehend even a fraction of that so i i used to ask why i don't ask why i leave that to him 
But then there is continuing to love God and be faithful to Him, even though the circumstances aren't turning out the way I'd like them, or even how I prayed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's faith or just a commitment to loving God anyway. In my heart, that's just a commitment to loving God anyway. When I look at my own life and my own circumstances. And I think that's right. And I think that's good. And I don't think our commitment to loving God should be based on our feelings or any sort of transactional things. That is the number one commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. No matter what the circumstances look like. No matter if He ever gives you a gift. Mm -hmm. no No matter what. That's it. And so that's number one. Love your neighbor as yourself is number two. But we're talking about faith. And faith is something different. Faith is believing and knowing for certain that God's going to do what He said He was going to do. And I don't know how much faith we really have. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because He tells us. It, it, it's, it's not like he's taunting us, but he's like, have faith. But here you are praying for something, and we say we're praying in faith. We're just believing, and, and I don't know if we're really believing or we're just really, really, really hoping yeah. that it'll happen. That's a great point. One of the things in our story kind of a little bit ahead is Aaron ends up in the hospital mm-hmm. with the placenta abruption, and this is about two months after the time in Mobile that we were just talking about. And she's bleeding internally. A uh, doctor comes in, pulls a couple of handfuls of, of, of clotted blood out of her, and mm. it, it really looks very, very dire. He leaves the room, comes back about three hours later, and essentially says, there's nothing we can do here. We cannot save both of you. And Aaron, we have to save you. And this is about a 10 or so minute conversation, and, and my wife is just quite honestly, unfazed by any of that. Because in Mobile, after we left the hospital, everything checked out fine. She was back up in her room. Uh, We were downstairs getting breakfast. And I'm bringing this back up because it pulls into the context of this conversation that the doctor's having when she has the placenta abruption a couple months later in December. But she's up in the room. I'm downstairs. She calls me and just, and she's kind of crying. And, and my heart just immediately drops. I'm like, what in the world is going on? She says, Well, I was just sitting here thanking the Lord that everything was okay. And the Lord said, This baby will be called Faith. And I actually got angry that she was calling me because I thought something was wrong. But she, that, to your point, Stacey, that was her mustard seed. That was her piece that she just held on to that the Lord spoke to her and said, this baby will be called faith. Fast forward to the two months I mentioned when she's in the hospital, placenta abruption, the doctor's coming back in now and having this conversation with her where he's saying, "There's we cannot save both of you and we have to save you, Aaron. And she's totally unfazed. In about 10 minutes into the conversation, I'm starting to sit up because I feel like I need to say something. I haven't said anything to this point because it, it is her body her you know all those things um and as i'm starting to sit up the doctor says look there's a zero percent chance this baby will make it and we have to save you aaron and she just looks at him squarely in the eye and says well doctor we believe in miracles and we want you to believe with us and i say all that stacy because as you're talking about faith i've always felt like and believed she had a level of faith in that moment that the lord could operate in. Yep, that's it. So, um, so, real quick, what do you mean God told her this baby will be named Faith? You know, I wish she was here to, to articulate that to you, but she's just talking to the Lord in her hotel room. And she felt like, not the audible voice, but the Lord spoke. Not audible. Not okay. audible. Okay. Um, but the Lord spoke to her spirit and said, very clearly to her, this baby will be called faith. And that was it. That I'm was always it. interested in hearing what the experiences of people are who say, God told me this. 
Um, but for her to definitively tell you, God told me this baby will be called faith. Doesn't seem like a lot of ambiguity in that. It doesn't seem like a lot of, I don't know, kind of saw the word faith on a commercial a second ago. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm yeah. wondering what that experience was like. It was, she says she was in prayer and she felt like a communication in her spirit that was so pressed upon her that it changed the way she responded to a physician telling her that they needed to take that baby. Um, yes, that is correct. 100%. And I think the thing that really stands out to me in that is, like you're saying, Stacey, she, it was, she was unmovable in that. And so even when a physician who she trusts, who we fully believe and have no, like, he was right. I mean, I, I think that's one thing that, that I would be very clear on. There was a 0% chance this baby would make it from everything we know now. I mean, Erin's at 22 weeks long in her pregnancy at this point. She had a 50% placenta abruption, which means the placenta had pulled away from the uterine wall by 50%. She was bleeding internally. She was contracting every minute. Um, there, there's really not a path to a viable, successful birth in that scenario. Um, but Erin wasn't concerned with any of that. She believed what God had told her. And I think as, as I saw her faith over the going forward weeks and months, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit in the story, but there comes a time faith is born very early at 25 weeks and two days, weighed one pound, 14 ounces. And that is a whole roller coaster and a whole other part of the story that maybe we'll talk about, maybe mm-hmm. we won't. But there were definitely times in, in kind of increasing levels of time where Faith just, she was not going to make it. We actually got transferred from one hospital to another because the one hospital said, there's nothing else we can do for your baby. Yeah, I remember reading that stuff in the book, and it's like, man, you would, this baby would clear a hurdle. I mean, if I remember correctly, at 22 weeks, there was a, a, a major episode that is basically what got you to this zero percent chance conversation. Correct. And the deal was they needed to go in like nowish and do this. Correct. But miraculously, Aaron holds on to this baby for like three more weeks, mm-hmm. which was a miracle in itself. Just after she had said, We believe in miracles, her faith had been built by what she had experienced. She experienced the Word of God, which built her faith. It went from being a blowing out a birthday candle wish into something that was real, and it was was unshakable. She had had faith at that point. It might have been that mustard seed, but it was something more than just wishing it would happen. So the baby is makes it to 25 weeks, which was critical. Critical, absolutely critical. And then throughout this time of baby faith being born, you guys would clear, and and I think people who have been down this road would say, yeah, that's exactly how it happens. I mean, you think you're in the clear and you've jumped these hurdles. It's like, oh my gosh. And then like the next day, it's the end. Correct. And it's a roller coaster. It, in, in in a a violent roller coaster, I think, and not 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 a gentle thing, but it's right. like so. Um, and that happened repeatedly during this time. Did Aaron's faith remain as unshakable as when she said those words to the doctor after he said zero percent chance? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Stacy. Um, trying to think of the right words to say that the short answer is yes but there's a caveat to that as we were going through that and and as all these roller coasters were happening and we get moved from one hospital to the next there does come a point where it just looks like she's just not going to make it faith is not going to you know to make it out of the hospital ever 
And I remember when we got moved to the second hospital, we could stay overnight with, with the baby, with Faith. So Aaron stayed that night, and I asked her, like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm staying here. I'm not leaving. I'm like, why? Like, let's go to bed, come back the next day. And she said, I, I don't know she'll be here the next day, and I'm not letting her pass without me being here. And I, what, what I saw in those moments, in that time, as all maybe, quote, quote hope seemed to be lost for faith running around on a soccer field in 10 years, Aaron's faith did not change. She realized the Lord said this baby will be called faith. And whether that's for mm-hmm. an hour, a day, or a thousand days, that's what I'm holding on to. And I will believe in that and I will hold to that. Because, like she said on our, our bathroom floor, when we, the very first night after a baptism, you know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, but either way, I'll bless your name. And so it was, that's one of the things that stood out the most to me is, is her ability to believe with, like you said, Stacy, 100% certainty that this baby would be healed and live. But even when that looked like it was not going to happen, her faith in who the Lord is and what he was doing didn't move. What about yours? Because it moved a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when 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 people experience extreme adversity in life, um, trauma, loss of uh, someone that is so dear to them that they don't know how they would go on without them, our peace at minimum, and oftentimes our faith is tied directly to the physical outcome of the circumstance. Yes. Did you feel like, and, and, and we'd, we'd like to, from afar, like to say, well, I, I need this, I really need this to happen, but I will remain faithful to you regardless. Mm-hmm. It's easy to say from a distance, Right. Might be a little bit more of a challenge um, up close and personal with it. Yeah. You know, my favorite Bible story has always been well before this situation with our daughter Faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so in Daniel, when they're asked to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, they're unwilling to do that. They're confronted by that decision. And Nebuchadnezzar says, well, you're going into the fire if you don't bow down to us or to me. And um, they said, we're not doing it. He said, well, what if your Lord doesn't save you? They said, well, we believe our Lord will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to you. And I've always kind of had that as, you know, that's the kind of faith I want. That's, you know, that I love that story because it's, I believe 100% that the Lord will deliver me. At the same time, if he chooses to deliver me in a way that is doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, I will still be faithful to him. Um, and that's wh- where, as, as we're talking earlier, and I think about this, when the Sunday school lesson becomes reality, like you're saying, when, when these situations that I've been talking about in the comfort of a small group with a cup of coffee in my hand for years is now my reality where I don't know if my wife's going to make it. And even when we realize she will make it, but our baby is not going to make it. There was just a peace that I had. And so you asked me earlier, how was my faith? Aaron seemed to be somewhat unshakable through most of this. Mine took a little more direct hits in, in bullet holes. But I remember on that night that Aaron stayed in the hospital when we got moved from one hospital to the other, and she stayed with Faith because she didn't think Faith was going to make it till the morning. We went to the restaurant close to the hospital and uh, we're just talking and we were talking it just Aaron and I, we were saying, you know, let's get some of our close friends together with us and just share with them what's going on, but ask them to pray, not just for healing for faith, but to give us wisdom about what type of heroic measures should we continue to do? 
Hmm. And, and, and I, we're comfortable with all decisions that people would have in that. I just, we were just, you know, what does the Lord have for us in this? And, um, I remember, cause what we were really saying is we don't think she's going to make it. And Lord, we need your wisdom about what we should do from a medical standpoint in this. But leaving that restaurant, there was just a piece that I had that, that literally made no sense. Even in my questioning, my frustration, my questioning of why is this happening, Lord? Why didn't you just, why did you let us get all these months down the road? Why didn't you just take faith back, you know, in September after the baptism? You know, what's the point in all this? I remember having a peace when I thought about, well, she's just not going to make it. And it, I didn't like it. I didn't understand it. I didn't question who God was, but I did have something that just made no sense. Can you um, describe it? You know, it, for me, it was just like looking at the worst possible outcome you could imagine and knowing that the pain you feel is so real and, and there's just no control I have over it. But at the same time, there was something there that was just like this, almost like this whisper of like, but you're going to be okay. We're, we're, we're going to get through this. You, you, you will have the opportunity to see her another, another time, even if it's not here on this earth. And it just, I, again, it's probably not the greatest words to describe it, but it was, it was knowing the reality is the worst thing that you could imagine but still having something inside of me that just says, we're going to get through this together. And um, I don't know. It made all the difference for me. <clears throat> Again, from afar, as I survey this landscape, and I, I, I'm, I'm in it often doing what I do now and having these kinds of conversations and you know, if you just spend time in Scripture and you get close to God, you you, you begin to you begin to view life a little differently. Um, the things that I prioritized in my life in my less spiritually mature, much less younger years really don't have the uh, the weight that they used to have. <clears throat> I tend to and and. Again, this is from afar. I am not facing the death of one of my children. Mm -hmm. Let's just be very upfront about that. And those who have done that might say, Stacy, you might likely feel different if you actually experience that. I tend to look at life as eternal. Mm -hmm. Because as Christians... We are certain that it is, that when we pass on this earth, that's not the end. In fact, in a great sense, it's just the beginning. Right. Scripture mentions this is but a breath, this life. Did you ever, before what appeared to be the end that you're talking about here, um, begin to get peace from the eternal perspective? Yeah. Um, so if I'm kind of understanding where you're going with that, during the process getting up to the point I was just describing, I absolutely felt different pockets of time where things were not looking good, where things were going the wrong way, even back to before Aaron had the placenta abruption and all those things, where I would feel what you're describing, Stacy, of... I know life is eternal. And even if Aaron doesn't make it through this situation, I have confidence that I will see her again. I absolutely felt those things and, and experienced that peace in those moments. For me, it what's the right word? Fleeting is not the right word. It wasn't fleeting, but it it was I would I would be talking to the Lord talking to another believer that was encouraging me, and I would feel that peace of, hey, Aaron's going to make it. You know, the Lord's with you. He, he, he's right there 
going through this with you. And I would get confidence, even if it didn't turn out what I was wanting, that I was going to be okay. But it would, but then, but then the world came back to my doorstep and then the doubts came back and the, the questions came back and the quote reality came yeah. back. And, and it just, it was one of those things that it was, it was like kind of grasping it, it, it water and trying to let it hold me up sometimes. And I say that from my own personal struggles, that that wasn't the Lord moving or, or changing. It was just the, the reality of the situation from an earthly perspective. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's very, I'd like to expound on that a little bit more in a second because the reality was an earthly reality. It wasn't an eternal reality, which is something you mentioned, Stacy. It was harder for me to keep focused on that eternal reality, which is the real reality going through that. And, yeah. And that, that was a big struggle of feeling filled up for 20 minutes or whatever the time frame might have been. And then the other 23 hours and, and, you know, 40 minutes of the day struggling. Yeah. And I, we have these conversations as a family every now and then my kids are asking more and more questions on, um, <clears throat> matters such as these. And I think it's interesting, especially we've gone to some pretty tough funerals lately as a family and, and that sort of thing. And I say, Hey, look, um, I may, I may go before all y'all. And I don't want you to be sad because I'm going to be in heaven and it won't be long and you'll be there too. And I want you to live long, full lives and I want to live a long, full life too. But, um, there will be no doubt Mm -hmm. that I'm going to be in heaven and I want you to have great, great peace around that because what I will be experiencing when you're in that point of separation will be far more, uh, glorious, beautiful, incredible, than anything that words on earth will ever be able to describe Amen. because he is God and he promises us. He talks about this. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an enthusiast about the reports we get from people who have passed away that have had near death experiences and come back and who have experienced, uh, believe firmly they've experienced a realm beyond this one. Um, it's, it's almost indescribable mm-hmm. just what they try to put into words and um, on what they experienced. And it's happened for thousands and thousands of people. It's not just a handful. And so I, I get excited about that. And when I talk about heaven and going to heaven, I get excited. I'll be honest with you. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think of things from an earthly perspective, we think this is what there is. Um, when somebody passes, our first thought is, oh, my God, I will never see them again. Mm-hmm. And they are so important to me. How will I live without them? And all the horrible things that we think around death begin to swamp us under. And so the question really was, it, was there ever a time where you would experience the peace of eternity? You know, Stacy, one comment that always stands out to me, I think, on this point that, that we're talking about here, about this eternal perspective and in... And I think there's this contrast of an eternal perspective, which is, again, the real reality that, you know, the, the, the Bible says, for the hope set before Christ, he endured the cross. And I always picture or think of that as the hope was, was heaven and being there with all of us together for eternity. But the world it just has this way of creeping in to try to distort or even, you know, for us believers, change our feeling on that, that, that reality. After Aaron had said, we're not taking this baby and the 0% chance kind of declaration from the physician, I think it was a day and a half later, I was talking to somebody very close to us and, um, they were essentially saying, you know, this is great that you all are believing for a miracle, but at some point you're going to have to face reality and know that this is not going to work. And it just kind of, it, it didn't even rattle me. It just was like the Lord dropped Mm. something inside of me in that exact moment that I needed to know in my response to that statement was, well, the reality is, 
over 24 hours ago, they said this baby would not make it another 24 hours. They said it was impossible for them to save both Aaron and the baby, and she was contracting every minute, and they couldn't stop that. Well, now it's 24 hours removed. Her contractions have stopped. Aaron has seemed to be doing okay, and there's not this level of bleeding that's creating her to bleed out internally. And things seem to be looking better, and faith inside of Aaron's tummy, which is the most protected place that she could be, seems to be doing well. That actually is the reality, even in a worldly sense, an earthly sense. And I, that just always, I don't know if that makes sense as I'm describing it, but it was really the situation where somebody that we trust, and I don't fault them for their, their comment on that, was saying, well, you have to face the reality that this isn't going to turn out well. But the even the earthly reality was, is this is moving in a better direction. Yeah. And how often does that come in and take away that eternal perspective? That's so good. And <clears throat> envisioning this person basically saying, hey, look, you know, I, I want you to be able to prepare yourselves so that you don't fall off a hard cliff, right? So, they, you're exactly that, right. That we can respond well if what appears to be inevitable happens, right? Don't get your hopes up too much. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly... But at the same time, I mean, I can count from your story at least three episodes while she was pregnant of bleeding, more profuse each time to where they're pulling clots out of her. Correct. That it's like, this isn't good. And yet here we are continuing to survive somehow. Mm -hmm. And all of this is really interesting after she felt like God says this baby is going to be called faith and, and you're right he didn't say for how long <laughs> right, I get that but our faith has to start by stepping out in faith when we don't see how it's possible mm -hmm. but I believe our faith is built after stepping out in faith a few times and seeing God's movement. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like I told you, in praying for healing um, for people, like my wife had a knee problem, debilitating knee thing. And I was learning about praying, healing, and things like this. And I'm like, so impressive to see other people and some of the things that they've reported and seen that I've seen. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing would love to have that kind of faith. And they were like, well, you just need to start, you know? And so <clears throat> I pray over her knee. And I, I, I mean, I pray like praying, healing, mm -hmm. not in my closet by myself, but with her and my right. hand on the, the place and commanding it from a, you know, a enemy of God perspective and those kinds of things and nothing. In fact, it got worse. <laughs> if you really want to know the truth, I'm like, oh, well, okay, well, there you go. I don't have faith, <laughs> and that's it, right? And it's like, no, that's not it. And so, a couple weeks later, I, I, I mustered up the courage to step out in faith again. Knee problem still. It's just the craziest thing. Pray nothing. Do it again. Nothing. Like a fourth time, and this is this isn't like back to back to back, right? I mean, this is like days, sometimes weeks. But I kept going back. I said, I'm going to step out in faith because God says that we have the authority to do these things. We just need faith. Mm -hmm. And me going back, I guess, it's like, okay, well, how many times you got to do it before you give up? Or how many times you got to do it before it happens? Right. Something about, I don't know, I don't know what fifth, sixth, seventh time, she didn't say anything in the moment. But two days later, it was gone. Mm -hmm. And she told me that. And I'm like, is she just telling me that to make me feel good? Because I didn't <laughs> heal her. I mean, God healed her. But the question is faith. And, and it's the building of our faith. And I started this little bit right there with um, saying, hey, look, we first have to step out in faith. Right. And, 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 and trust what God says. And if we step out in faith and we don't see it happen immediately, do we shrink back under our rock? 
Or do we continue to step out in faith, believing in Him? And when we begin to experience it, so I experienced that. And something happened like two or three weeks later. And then two or three weeks after that, I'm like, oh my goodness. This is a reality that I have not experienced before. Faith is being built in me where I'm, I believe it's going to happen now. Yeah. And it started to happen. So when your baby faith, or when Aaron doesn't lose the baby the first time, when you were certain it had, doesn't lose the baby the second time, when you were certain you had lost the baby, the third time, it's like, not going to make it 24 hours. Zero percent chance. Mm-hmm. And 24 hours later, it's like, we're still here. Are you, is this building your faith? Or are you just riding the roller coasters like, oh my gosh, no. Okay, yay. (laughs) Oh no, yay. Or is it like, hold on. The circumstances aren't going to dictate my level of faith. Yeah. It, um, you know, my faith was building. It's funny you ask that question in that way, Stacy, because it, it it's 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 kind of yes to all of those things you just said. My faith was doing this on a roller coaster, but it's almost like the the old stock market graph, you know. But it was steadily increasing. Yeah. And so even in all these kind of starts and stops, and you know, things are are they look okay? They don't really look better, but they look okay for a minute, and then they look worse, and you know, kind of like as the situation is going this way and my faith kind of goes with it, it does climb a little bit each time. And I think what you're, one of the things that I've learned that I've taken now 12 years removed from that is no matter the outcome, I have full faith that the Lord can heal and do exactly what he says he can do. No questions asked. And I believe that a hundred percent. I also know if that answer to the healing or the situation looks differently than what I have wanted it to be, I have full faith and confidence in that. And and I guess what I would try to summarize that to say is, as I was going through this, I felt like I was a basket case of emotions and all over the board, but it was like the Lord was just giving me these little building blocks of faith that was being built little by little each time and, and, and obviously it's still happening. Like, I mean, that's still an ongoing process in my life and will be forever, I'm sure. But it really, in that in situation with Faith, our daughter, I would say the biggest thing that, that really sw- switched for me was when things looked e- entirely hopeless with Faith. And I mentioned coming out of the restaurant, like we just started to have this peace. And then close to that time, there was another couple that we highlight in the book, and I won't get into their story, but they, very similar situation, but they lost their baby during this time. And I know they believed just as hard and had just as much faith, heck, probably even more than me. But even in that situation, they had a faith that was so strong about what the Lord is doing inside of them and the, the, the confidence that they will see their baby again, uh, like you talked about earlier. So I guess this, this is a long-winded way to say seeing the, the direction be different than what I expected, but feeling God's presence and ultimately seeing Him heal in so many ways. Like, I mean, true miracles, our baby is still here. And they were given, she was given a 0% chance. But seeing all that has built my faith where it does give me this confidence to believe, yeah, I'll pray for your wife's healing on her knee with you because I know that it can happen. Yeah, reading the book, interesting. I mean, you you didn't like necessarily portray yourself as some sort of emotional superhero in the book, right? I mean, you you're, <laughs> no. you sometimes you're screaming and yelling. One time you like took off running in the rain with your suit <laughs> on from suit work, on, yeah. and <laughs> another time you, your your iPhone ends up in the bushes somewhere, and you got to go back and you know it's a whole thing and and. and <laughs> And, and you experience all those things and you, it's like, okay, sometimes in the, in the moment, it's hard to see those things. But I think when you get a little, little space and you're just like, okay, maybe I was up and down, but the, the trend line was going up from a faith perspective overall. Yeah. And I think, again, I just, 
it's easy, like you said, to look back 12 years or to, to sit in a situation where the reality is not happening right in front mm-hmm. of you. But um, I think the Lord gives us these things. I mean, the Bible is very clear that there are, I guess you could call them tests, but I mean, we are to, to, to uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Rejoice in all types of, of challenges and, and trials and tribulations. And I think the Lord gives us those things to build something inside of us that, that we, we just have to have. Yeah, the circumstances not working out the way we'd ideally have liked it. I think we have enough experience now that we, I, I personally believe that all of it reveals something about the nature of God that is important to us. Mm-hmm. That's why we should rejoice in our tribulation, in our trials, because we are are in a position to know God in a richer way. Yes. In my view. And ultimately, it is about knowing God and being in Him and Him in us forever. That's what Jesus talks about. It's His prayer in the high priestly prayer, John 17. Uh, you read throughout that. It is, you know, talks in, in, in throughout John. Um, I and the Father are one. Um, that they may be one as we are one and um, that they may be where I am. And it's this union mm-hmm. of us with God. And it's not that it doesn't happen when everything's rainbows and sunshine. It happens there too. But it really <laughs> accelerates sometimes when it's when it's really dark and stormy and when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and can fear no evil. Yes. He doesn't take you around the valley of the shadow of death. It's through the valley of the shadow of of death. Yeah. For I am with you. And, And so I think it's the ways that he reveals his presence and nature in those things that, we may see at the time. We may not see until 12, 20, 30 years later. Yeah. I would expect that some of those things are being revealed to you anew, you know, each day. Yeah, they are. And it's, um, and I want to comment on, on kind of some of, some of the revelations I've, I've, I've experienced even recently. Yeah, for sure. That, but I do want to hit on something you just said, Stacy, because it's so important and critical to me. And I think just in our faith journey is, you mentioned kind of we're united with the Lord. He's there with us. He doesn't take us around the valley of the shadow of death. He takes us through it, but he, he gives us relationship with other believers. And, and that was something that really stood out in the journey Aaron and I went through with faith, our daughter. I remember the day or the situation when the doctor said there's a 0% chance that this baby will make it kind of debriefing after that, or kind of just absorbing the shock waves of it. I'm thinking I don't have the faith that the size of a mustard seed. I don't know how big a mustard seed is. I'm pretty sure it's not real big, but I don't even have that. And I remember thinking, literally thinking, who in my life is crazy enough to believe that this could happen? Who in my life has enough faith to believe that? And I called, and I, a name came to my mind, and I called that friend, and he mm. came and prayed with us. And I say that just from the standpoint of it's so important for all of us and especially as believers, but to have that community of other believers who can join with us. Because essentially I was borrowing some of my friend's faith just the same way I borrowed some of Aaron's faith through this journey and many others, but it's so critical. Sometimes we just, we need each other. Yeah, that is really good. And we don't do that. We go in the opposite direction. We get darker, uh, deeper down in our hole, and 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 sort of isolate ourselves a lot of times. But you know, when when you're when you're drowning, to think, wait a minute, who do I know that's standing up on the dock? Exactly. It's like reach <laughs> to that person and let them. Yeah, that's really good. That's an important piece of spiritual advice and truth. Yeah, I think often about you know, the, the Lord is very clear. Like, do not. Uh, forsake the meeting together. And I think I, I think of that in the context of 
going to church on a Sunday, which I absolutely believe is extremely important. But it, but it is also about being around a body believers. Like we just need to have close friendships, and the Lord gives that to us. And I think it's just so critical. And it, it for sure was both people we knew very closely and people that we were meeting for the first time during what we went through with faith. We needed all those people because yeah. their faith helped us. What do you think eventually? ultimately resulted in faith's survival? Hmm. It's a question I've struggled with a lot, and I honestly struggle with it as we were writing this book, because, um, again, all I can tell you is is what is, is in my heart. We did not want to write a book that kind of highlighted or said, do these four things, pray this way, whatever it might be, and when you're in your dark day of a situation, then this will happen. Because like you said earlier, it, the Lord works in ways that are just different. And so, and I know other people, like I've said, and this is just a very important part to my heart in this, my sister's one of them, their baby went to to heaven at 23 weeks Mm -hmm. and they believe they prayed and and others that I could go on and on about, which I won't. That said to answer the question, um, I don't know that I believe there's like a formula and I, you know, of kind of what to do here. That said, I think if my wife had not have had a faith, if I had not have had a faith in something bigger than the situation we faced. If if the Lord had not spoken to my wife in Mobile and said, this baby will be called faith, the way I process that, the way I see that is we start to make different decisions. We believed, and for sure my wife believed, that the Lord could absolutely heal this baby, even when the doctor said and the medical community said there's a 0% chance. That That didn't come from a magical hope or a, I think I'm smarter than you, Mr. Physician. It came from, no, I believe the Lord is going to do what he said he's going to do. And so that faith that she had resulted in different decisions to different situations that continued to put our baby faith in a better position for the Lord to do what he wanted to do. Um, So, and I also, I would, say I do think the medical community and all that, the wisdom that the Lord has given us in at that point, 2011, helped with that too. And I think all that came from the Lord. But to say it is, is maybe concise as I can, um, I think having a faith, no matter what the outcome may or may not be, allowed us to make decisions that help put faith in a position to thrive and succeed and if we hadn't had that, when the doctor yeah. said that, we would have said, yes, let's induce labor. Yeah, it, it's a it's a really difficult topic to consider because you think, okay, we listen to Scripture and believe Scripture, and we do. Back to faith of the size of a mustard seed. Ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. Mm-hmm. Jesus says that multiple times in the book, in the book of John and in other places. It's like, okay. I'm going to ask that my baby survive. And they don't. And then I look at Scripture and I think of Lazarus raised Mm -hmm. from the dead in there for four days. And Jesus fully intending to demonstrate the power of God and the goodness of God in an extraordinary way and does. But earlier in the ministry, the one who paved the way, John the Baptist, mm-hmm. Jesus is, could go and do the same thing, and they cut his head off. You know? Yeah. Uh, uh, we start maybe. asking why around these things. You know, John the Baptist, man, what an advocate. What, what would have been something if he were an apostle as well? I mean, what, what would have been written to build the Christianity mm-hmm. coming from John the Baptist if he goes through that whole thing um, with Jesus and is, a, is there after Jesus' crucifixion. It's a, 
that's not what God had intended and not what he had planned and certainly not what happened. And you kind of think as humans, I think we all get to that place, well, if I were God, I would have done it differently or whatever. And of course, right. now we're really, uh, we know we're stepping into ridiculous territory <laughs> there. Um, but it's just, it, it, you, you can't answer that question. You just can't do it. It's like, wh- why did God save faith? Right. And, and Stacey, I, I love what you just said. And I think that that analogy of Lazarus and John the Baptist is, we were talking earlier, things that I haven't thought about might come up through this. I, that That is so beautiful to me from because, it, you know, I don't, nobody has an answer for that. Why did he save Lazarus and not John the Baptist? And I agree, like, what wisdom could have come from John the Baptist and, and that we could have all gained, you know, if he could have lived longer? To to tie back to the topic of our discussion here today, I will say going through this situation with faith, seeing how Aaron handled certain things, other people handled certain things, my faith is so much different today because I've seen both sides of that and I question so much less, meaning I've seen where I know for a fact, if it wasn't for God's hand, the healing wouldn't have happened. I I do not question that at all. And I've also seen it in other people and experienced it somewhat in my own heart when, when the situation does not turn out how I want it from an earthly standpoint, that there is peace and faith and strength and confidence there fully that that makes no sense from an earthly perspective. And so as I would pray for people now, I do pray with a higher level of confidence. Like you were saying, I believe God is going to heal you. I believe God is going to to change this situation. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if he chooses to do it another way, but even if he doesn't, I, I have full confidence that you are going to be fully okay and fully healed in whatever that ultimately looks like. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest things I have taken from this whole situation of being able to pray more confidently into true healing. And at the, in the, in the and it's not an either or at the same time, knowing that God has you no matter what. Are there things that you notice about the way God moved then that you recognize now but you couldn't see then um i am more aware to you know to use a silly christian phrase that we all all know like let go and let god you know i um i i, I do struggle less with some of the anxieties and questionings that I think I had back then. And I attribute a lot of that to my wife and just seeing how Aaron was fully unfazed because she heard from the Lord uh, about what was going to happen with our baby. So that's probably an answer I haven't, or a question I haven't thought of as much, but I do know that there's just this, there's just a, a way that I see things today it gives me a lot more confidence than I would have seen them in 2011. Yeah, and that's the question I would ask is, is, you know, how are you living your life differently now based on what you experienced during that time? And I think that's probably the answer you're given right there. Um, a lot of the prophecies about the Messiah weren't necessarily noticed at the time that they were occurring with Jesus. But given some time, the guys were like, Oh crap. That just that <laughs> Remember when he did that fulfills that one and oh this happened so that fulfilled that one back there and that one right. look at all these things that have been fulfilled that we were completely unaware of in the moment. Mm-hmm. Do you do you look back or do you experience things now or do you look back on then with with the passage of time with spiritual maturity and and see things that God was doing back there that maybe you didn't recognize as God doing something back there that you're able to see from from the distance, from space. 
Yes. And the, the way, at least what comes to my mind when you ask that question, um, I, I, I questioned a lot of, you know, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, I'm thinking of better ways that all this could have went, went down, <laughs> you know, and that's obviously silly, but I was, um, when we started to get serious about the process of writing this book, we prayed and for years prayed about it, talked to people, ended up, we're going to do it. We feel like God's leading us to this. We're just going to do it. And, uh, we got some professional help. Uh, and I remember a lady came in, Molly, who's just a huge help in all this process to us from Seattle, spent about four days with us, interviewed us and others during this process. And we're sitting on our back porch and we were just talking. We'd been kind of through this emotional rehashing of all this. And it, and honestly, I didn't think it was going to be that emotional and it wasn't up until this point. But as Molly just had continued to ask me questions over three or four days and ask Aaron and others, the Lord kind of revealed something to me that I did not was not expecting. And basically, um, I've always prayed, Lord, help me to be a better example for you. Help me to be a better witness for you. Like, I, I'm not a great evangelist. So, you know, like, it's just, I, I, I'm very comfortable and very confident in my faith, and I have no problem sharing that with people. But like going up to the guy at the checkout line and striking up a conversation about Jesus and trying to share the gospel with him has always been something that intimidates me and I struggle with. As I'm sitting on my back porch with Molly and my wife when we're kind of wrapping up these interviews she's doing, I mean, I just broke down because it really became very clear that one of the things that stood out during this process to me so much was the Lord had given, at least me personally, an ability to share what was really going on with others and to share my faith with others on a platform that I never had before. One of the things we haven't talked about in this context of the podcast, we were doing a blog, a Caring Bridge thing during the time Faith was born, and it was written from her perspective, and it was kind of corny and hokey, but it was, generally speaking, always positive. We always ended with some type of biblical message that was communicated from her child perspective and, and with a Bible verse. And that was just what the Lord was speaking to us. And then we were sharing that with others. And I say all that to say, I look back now and I realize I would have never asked for that situation. I would have never asked for my wife to go through that pain for my baby to, to have to live in a box in an incubator for four and a half months when she's just born. I would never ask for my wife to have to leave the hospital without her baby and go through all the emotional challenges and physical challenges that went through all that. And, but I would never be able to at least share in the way that I have been able to share what the Lord shared with me without those experiences. I would never be able to sit here and have as much confidence in who he is unless I had those experiences. And, and, and as we have now written this book, um, and, you know, people have read it. We've gotten a number of, of text phone calls from folks saying, hey, this meant something to me. This, this helped me in my situation that's totally different from the birth of a premature baby. This helped me see the Lord in a different way. And that has nothing to do with me or Aaron. It has everything to do with the Lord showing himself. And without this experience for us, we would not be able to share that in that same way. So honestly, Stacey, I don't remember the exact question you had, but I do but I do look back after 12 years now and realize I would have never asked for that. I don't want to ask for it again. I think about my wife saying when she's getting baptized, Lord, I don't want to just do this. I want it to change my life forever. And I think he said, okay. And here's a way that we're going to do that that will hopefully help other people in their impossible situation. Hmm. Yeah. Cause throughout the thing, you're constantly asking the question, why is this happening to us? Yes. And, and I didn't even, and let me just say, I don't even like admitting that I was asking that because I fully acknowledge and fully believe what was happening to us while challenging and especially what was happening to Aaron and faith 
pales in comparison to others. Right. I understand that. But what's been revealed and is continuing to be revealed to you is, in your view, God saying, so that my works can be shown in this world so that I can bring others into the kingdom just like you want to be a part of. Wasn't that it was... Yes, it, it you there were trial. It was a suffering for you, um, but I was with you the whole time, and it was part of my plan to include you in kingdom work that you would never be able to do, and a fulfillment that you would never be able to experience without it. And you think about people whose children don't survive, and you're like, well, what kind of fulfillment is that? Well, if we stay in the place of the the loss of a child I would imagine it would be pretty hard mm-hmm. for forever but if we search for a some purpose beyond that yes how how is this how is God working this for good how can I participate in God's plan given what has gone on you know you wonder if if things hadn't turned out with faith would you uh, who knows right but you went through this you wouldn't sign up for it again Mm -mm. but you wouldn't trade it for the world correct but you wouldn't trade it for the world i wouldn't imagine i can't speak for you i'm not going to put words in your mouth but i just kind of did but no i'll agree you those are the right words i would not trade it for the world and i would never ask for it again that's right you know, let me say this, Stacy, real quick, because I think it just drives on the point you're just saying. And this is honestly not about our story, but I think it is spot on to what you're just describing. I heard a story of a, another gentleman last year who I work with, and he was in a mountain biking accident and um, basically was paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Now, through honestly the Lord healing him and doctors and work, he can he can walk, but it's very very challenging. He was a mountain biker, snowshoer, you know, skier, all this stuff. He said that he was really in a bad place about six years after that had happened. And um, this guy that had mentored him through that said, let me ask you something. If you, if the Lord came to you and said, look, I'm going to give you your legs back and you can run, walk, do all the things that you used to love, that that, that was kind of life for you. It only costs you one thing. And that one thing is all the people you've met, all the experiences you've had, all the the revelations that you've been able to gain since that accident because of that accident and all the people you've been able to share and touch with, that has to go away. Would you take your legs back? And he's like, not at all, not even a question. And I think that's, again, just on to the point you're trying to, to drive home here. The Lord gives us things, I think, that in so many cases we would never ask for. He will never leave us through those. Like we said earlier, He will walk with us through the valley. He might not take us around it. He can and does heal us in those situations and do things that only He can do. But it is always about somebody on the other side. There's a benefit to us whether physical or emotional or spiritual, but there are other people on the other side of those things that the Lord is taking us through that so that he can then help somebody else see who he is. And I think that's such such a beautiful perspective to have as we walk through challenges like you were just talking about. Yeah, and hey, I know I know a lot of people whose story didn't have the ideal or the happy ending and it was it was not favorable who still see that purpose. Mm. A lot of people that have been on here that have lost children, mm-hmm. have lost people that are very close to them, spouses, uh, parents way too young, um, <clears throat> so many others that um, they'll tell you that. Yeah. They, you know, would they take their person back? Absolutely. 
but would they return the opportunity God has given them to participate in the building of his kingdom through their experience? No way. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's a big deal. It's, you know, I don't know if it's easy to say. It's just the truth. And, you know, I asked the question that really kind of got us into that was, from the perspective you have now, do you see how God was moving in places? And I think you mentioned it before. You know, you look back and no way faith survives if this thing doesn't happen or this person doesn't pop into the scene somehow Mm -hmm. or this doctor doesn't return a text message or all these little things that you begin to look back and see with clarity that you were just part of life at the time that were just absolutely critical um, for that to happen. Yeah. You know, see, it feels like it's loaded with it, but where you ended up going was we see that this was a setup <laughs> to some degree. Mm-hmm. It was a setup to prepare us to be people who go and participate in making disciples through this story and, yeah. and building the ability to write and articulate things in a creative way that would pave the path to write a book down the line. Mm-hmm. You didn't write the book immediately. It's like a 12 years later, <laughs> 10 years later, something like that. Um, so looking back and seeing how it built you into the family um, that has a ministry, Yeah, to put it quite frankly. And I believe likely the beginnings of a ministry, if you ever had to guess. I think um, God is building upon this, this little premature baby girl faith is now 12? Yep, 12 years old. How's she doing? She's doing awesome. <laughs> she's a um, soccer player. She's active. She's fast. She's funny. And she's funny. Um, and she, um, she's a fighter. You know, she, she's got a spunk to her, and, um, but she's doing wonderful. And, uh, and you're going to see her do things in her life. They're going to make you cry with joy at her impact. Probably already had some, but mm-hmm. it's going to happen. And, and you're going to look back on the hard and say, it was all pieces of it. Yeah, you know, you talk about things we've seen her do and we will see her do, and obviously there are some. And one of the things, we did a a book launch party for our book in November of this past year, 2023, and it was a big deal. We had like 100 people coming over to our house, and I was a basket case about, you know, I don't want to ask people to come celebrate, you know, this, but I I should. And anyway, that's a whole other topic. But (laughs) – um the day of the party, Faith comes home from school and she says, hey, uh, I want to show you something. So she hands me this note and she's written a little speech, which is not her personality, uh, to say. And I'm like, and I read it, I'm like, Faith, you got to say this. Like, you have to share this with people. It'll be the most incredible part of the evening. She's like, absolutely not. I'm not standing up in front of these people and, and talking. So we encourage her to do it, uh, pray for her. And she comes up to me right before and said, hey, do you think I need to... I said, I don't really don't want to read my card. I just want to talk. And I said, that would be even better. So Dan, to just kind of give you a little example, Stacy, like she literally at 11 years old at that time stood in front of 100 people in our backyard and just said, essentially from her heart, we just want to thank you all so much for praying for us, for believing us. This has been a very important journey for our family and it means the world that y'all would show up. And we know that the Lord did a miracle in our life. And and we just are thankful that you're celebrating it with us. Something like that. Mm. And it just, I don't know. That might not make it into the podcast or not. But I just, it was such a beautiful picture. And when you say, like, what will faith do in her life? You know, what can all of us do? I mean, when, when we open our hearts to the Lord, we are, I mean, the Lord has a purpose for us. That's a little miniature version yeah. of... Hearing God's voice, because God gave her that, whatever she wrote out. Absolutely. And feeling the discomfort Mm. 
of hearing God tell us what He wants us to do, feeling and experiencing this, the discomfort that, quite frankly, is very intentional, being obedient anyway, and then becoming a different version of ourselves that's growing. That's so good. You know, that's yeah. exactly what happened that day. You can see it. It happened to you, too. Mm-hmm. It's probably happening to Aaron, too. I have not talked to Aaron, but I, I, I would have bet. That, and Rebecca, she's got her own story. Yeah. Guarantee you. And, and God is uh, shaping. I tell you what I also find interesting in all of this. Uh, the situation was clearly dire. And it began to turn, in my view, from what I hear, it began to turn when Aaron got quiet and listened for God. Hmm. And he spoke. And when he spoke, she knew it was him. And she didn't waver from it. And she was given faith. Hmm. And that, I, I guess every pun intended on that because she was given faith mm-hmm. in that moment when God said, she will be called faith. You didn't know the gender of this baby. We didn't, not at the time. But he gave Aaron faith as he gave your family, the girl, who would become faith. Mm-hmm. And it was that mustard seed of faith, I believe, that brought your faith into the world mm-hmm. through all of the roller coasters of the of the pregnancy, certain that you've lost her two or three, maybe more times to be brought into the world, certain that you lost her two or three more times and now here she is. It was, it was rooted in faith. And it was a faith that was given to her because, because she got quiet and listened for God and heard Him. Mm. And we can, every one of us can do that. Yeah. We don't have to to see an illumination in the sky or hear an audible voice, to be still and seek Him, to go after Him when things aren't like they need to be or when they are like they need to be, Mm -hmm. to quiet ourselves and get into a space of, I just want you. I just want to hear you. And she heard Him. Um, I don't have anything to add to that, Stacey. That was... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was good I, uh, I've i I've not seen it that way before but I just think about you know um, just what you said just me sitting here today this is Aaron's story it's really God's story obviously but uh, I feel like a surrogate speaking for Aaron in some ways in this but she got quiet before the Lord and it wasn't even a long period I mean she had a, a discipline of that, but thinking about that hotel room in Mobile, she just got quiet before the Lord and thanked Him for something that looked, even to most of us, very uh, unlikely, even at that point. Um, and He gave her what she needed to continue to take those steps when the, the stakes got even higher and higher. And I love what you said, we all have the ability to do that. And I think, you know, I believe 100% God can heal anything. He can just do it just like that. I think in a lot of cases he does it through people because he wants us to participate in the process, and you alluded to some of that earlier. And I think also, and there's something that I obviously, honestly, that's a newer revelation for me talking with you today is, he gives us these this this faith to then make some better decisions that allow us to be in better positions for him to continue to move in where he's wanting us to go. And sometimes it just starts with a, a simple time of just being quiet and honest before the Lord and anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. And 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 
we experience his goodness and his uh, the way he wows us, which builds our faith, which causes us to be able to step out in faith, which causes us to see his goodness, <laughs> which builds our faith, and it just kind of keeps going and going. And um, you know, it, <clears throat> what started there um, has, in true God fashion, rippled in countless directions, and not the least of which is the building of your faith mm -hmm. and and your leadership and your desire to proclaim this story in His name. And I'm not sure if there's a book unless that is stirred in you, how God stirs that in you. You're you're sitting here now doing this. You've spoken many times. I think faith is going to take a big cue from you and your leadership and what God has done in you and how this has rippled out. It's just so, it is so cool. I just sit here and look at it and it's just cool. Did God miraculously save your daughter? Probably so. Probably so. Yeah. But you know, there's a lot of premature babies that make it. Yep, absolutely. And a naturalist would say, well, that, yeah, some make it, some don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't want to sound calloused, but it's just statistics. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. And you get down in the story and you see the workings of God. And as a spiritual person, you see, just like, hey, yeah, I hear what you're saying. There's more going on here than that. Amen. Yes. Yeah, I've thought about that a ton, and because um, I mean, again, some there's a lot of babies out there, and they, their parents aren't believers, and I'm, you know, I'm just, and they make it. That's right. But I love what you said, Stacy. Uh, there's just more going on here than what we sometimes allow ourselves to see with our natural eyes. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you talk about this story and you think the book is called Zero Percent Chance. And I think the tagline or the beat that goes from that is, you know, what do you do when... What do you do when there's nothing you can when do? When there's nothing you can do. And you're thinking, okay, this is going to be a miracle of God healing. Okay. I think there's a piece of that for sure. Um, but that's not what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not what it's about. No. It's about who you are now. Mm -hmm. It's about who faith is now. It's about who your wife is now. It's about her getting quiet before God and how we can all learn from that. Mm -hmm. that, yes. that Aaron wasn't specially ordained to be one of the very, you know, one in eight million people to, to, to receive a word from God. Right? Right. Absolutely. He's ready to do that right now, today, with every single person listening to this. Amen. I love that. And that's a huge heart of, our, of, of, of the story we're trying to tell with this book. And one of the things, as we've shared the story in different ways, and I think you might have picked up on this if you re when you read the book, um, one of the things we, that stood out to us is no matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, the Lord can absolutely use you and wants to use you and has a purpose for you. And we kind of show that from the standpoint of in the book, uh, the lady that came in to clean our room when Aaron was on bed rest, her name was Gloria. At least that was her name we gave her in the book. He, he changed it for, for privacy purposes. And then the head of neonatology at the hospital we were at, we became very close with both in different ways but they both gave us things that we could not have made it without. Gloria came into our room every single day, and she would sing gospel songs. She would pray with Aaron. She would pray with me. And she just brought positivity into that situation that, that we had to have. The doctor who was the head of neonatology obviously brought a wisdom in uh, an expertise and an understanding from a medical perspective that we needed but one of the things he brought that was so much more important than that was hope. I remember him telling me one day when I was meeting with him in his office, he had face name on a sticky note on his computer because he was praying for her. It's like I do that for most all of my patients. And I just say that from the standpoint of just to highlight or add on to what you're saying, Stacy, that the Lord has this for every one of us. 
he has those opportunities to just make a difference in somebody else's life, to get quiet before him, and then he and just watch what he does. I mean, watch what he can, watch the picture that he can paint in front of us. I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. It's really good. Um, Remind of the verse because you've said all of these. You're talking about the love shown to you by those people. You think about the love of God and the way he shaped all of this. And you've got, you've talked about hope and of course faith. And it's like <laughs> these three remain mm-hmm. faith, hope, and love. The yeah. rest of these is love. And, um, yeah, so many cool things that are like circling back and, and taking a, a, a really complex, seemingly at times disjointed, um, series of events and shaping them into this tapestry that is a beautiful spiritual work of art that is becoming the ministry of your family. We've covered covered so much about what all this is and what it means and and how it's shaped you and things that you can see about the nature of God and his movement in hindsight and um, and that sort of thing. Is there an overall message that you uh, think that you've been given or you uh, would want to relay based on all of it? I mean, not just the events of of the pregnancy and her uh, struggles and survival, but even, even beyond that? Is there something bottled up that it's like, hey, if I had, if I had a message to deliver, it would be this? Yeah, I love that question. And, you know, if I was going to summarize what you just described, like the, you know, everything that if I'm going to sit here and if if you gave me, you know, two and a half minutes to share what I would want to share the most important thing, it would be the tagline of the book. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Because we are all going to face situations that are either impossible, seemingly impossible, or if there are answers, they're just not good answers. It's just, it's life. That's just how it works. And we have to have something bigger in our life than that situation. And we've talked around about this during this conversation. But in that, I mean, again, I, I'm not going to tell people what that is, but I am going to tell people what that is. It's, it's your faith in Christ. Having a faith in Jesus Christ will give you the ability to have 100% faith that that healing can happen. And it will give you an ability to know that if that healing happens in a way that makes no sense to you, you can have 100% faith that there is a peace and a confidence that you can move through that situation in a way that, that will make no sense to the world. And on top of that, it will give you an ability to make a difference in the lives of other people which whether you're a believer or not, we're all wired for that because God gave it to us. We all want to make a difference. We all want to know that we mattered, and we all do matter. And um, that's what I would say is, man, just if you're on the fence about who is this Jesus guy and do I really believe what the Bible says, just it's important enough to try to ask some questions of him. Figure it out. Talk to him as silly as that might sound if you don't know him. And just see what he does. Because I can tell you it's real. And it's not real because my baby is here. It's real because of the peace that I've experienced in in my own personal heart and what I've seen others do. That is so beautifully said. I got nothing that I can add to that. That's so good. Blake Hamby, you've been given a gift. You've been given many gifts. Uh, but you've been given the gift of a story and the ability to tell it. And I don't think it's the last story you're going to have. And so I am just thankful to sit across the table and talk to you. Child of God to child of God, man to man, Jesus fan to Jesus fan, dad to dad, husband to husband, about... um how God has moved in your family through 
an unbelievable set of circumstances, but the lessons you've been taught and you've uh, your ability to articulate and the gift that he's given you. And so um, I just love it, man. I love it. It's so much good about this, and there's so much good ahead because of this. And I just, I'm thankful for you. Thank you, Blake. Well, thank you, Stacy. And before we kind of conclude, I would just say thank you for giving me and my family. I know Aaron and the girls aren't able to be here with me, but thank you for giving us this opportunity to have a conversation. It is exactly like what you said. I, this was nothing on notes I would have had. Um, <laughs> but I thank you even more importantly for uh, all the stories, all the people that you're just trying to highlight uh, for you know, whoever is willing to listen to the podcast. It's important and in your heart of just trying to highlight the fact that God is who he says he is, Jesus is real, and we have he gives us a an opportunity to step into this faith that will change our life forever. So I thank you for that, most importantly, because I know this is a lot of work and takes time and effort and and you, you do it well. And so thank you for not just this with you and I, but the bigger picture. Man, that means a lot. I really do appreciate it. It is the joy of my life. It really is. I, I, I guarantee you that most people listening to this right now say, man, I wish I was the first person sitting across the table from all these awesome stories about the movement of God. <laughs> so it is my joy. And um, today has been no exception. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Was faith survival a miracle? Given the circumstances specific to her, it probably was. But even if you chalk it up to just good fortune, Blake and Aaron will tell you that they used to believe in God, but that 12 years ago, they experienced God in a way that has changed their understanding of Him forever, and that you can too. And I believe they would tell you that even if faith hadn't made it. But she did, and God's plan for her is just beginning. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. We've included a link in our episode description for Blake's book, Zero Percent Chance. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? You'll find a lot of details about this story we weren't able to cover today. Plus, you'll really get to know Blake, Aaron, and the key players in this story. And it's really well written. You'll enjoy reading. If you'd like to reach out to us for guest suggestions, prayer, or anything else, please visit astrongerfaith.org slash contact. If you feel like God is prompting you to support this ministry financially, you can do that at astrongerfaith.org slash give. Until next time, we pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.